to the Nest Podcast, your home for nerd entertainment and sports talk, where your hosts, Brandon and Zach, hash out what's happening in video games and sports every week. Enjoy the show. Hey guys, what's up? And welcome back to another episode of the Nest Podcast. This is episode 71, the George Connor episode, and we are presented by Sportzilla. I'm your host, Brandon, and joining me are two MVP award winning co hosts. I've got Zach, my main man, and then I've got from the bearded Biesta, Adam. What's up, guys? How's it going? Howdy. What's up? Adam, welcome back. You've been on a number of times, uh, of course, most famously with our Game of Thrones episodes, uh, but you're also a sports fan. We've had you on talking a lot of sports in the past. Welcome back. How's it been going, man? Oh, man, it's been good. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I just got through school. Uh, I've, I've basically been MI for a couple of months of podcasting. I'm trying to get back on the, the wagon with that, but I've been enjoying Football as much as I can, uh, obviously MMA, with the UFC 245 this past weekend, and I'm ready to you know catch up and talk some sports with you guys. Awesome. And uh, on a personal note, I know that you got married recently, so congratulations to you and your your wife. You know, thank you. Welcome, welcome to our lives. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's 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 great. It's uh, I'm also glad to have that behind me too. That was a lot of a lot of stress with planning. Yeah, for sure. It it definitely can be, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's kind of funny that during all that time that you say you were so busy happened to have been right when all of the the scandal broke loose there in Houston. And you you continuously dodged us. We invited (laughs) you on week after week after week. And you kept being like, yeah, that sounds good. Oh, no, man, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we finally got you. We finally trapped you. We told you we weren't going to talk about it, but guess what? Let <laughs> us know what's going on in Houston, man. What What are the people saying? Okay, so I guess I am. I might be biased right now, but I would say I am the best person to ask because, as you guys both know, and most of my friends and other people that know me know, I am not an avid baseball fan. I do not follow it religiously. I know most of the Astros because I watch baseball during postseason so i follow the you know the good guys and whatever but i good guys the, the guys that you know altuve <laughs> all the big ones <laughs> anyway so i bring it up to a lot of houston fans a lot of the people i know that you know the astros are near and dear to their heart and i'm i i ask them like hey what do you guys think of all this astro scandal going on like what's your take on it And most of what I hear is, you know, they're very disappointed. I hope it's not completely true. It's 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 it sucks. It's heartbreaking. But the most popular thing I hear, which honestly kind of irritates me, is everyone's doing it. We just got caught. My biggest thing is, you know, you guys have first brought up to me. I was like, have you guys heard of this, you know, Astro scandal going on with the videos? And you're like, where have y'all been or where have you been? (laughs) And I'm like, dude, I don't I don't know shit about baseball. Like I'd. I thought everyone records everyone like, you know, it's people steal signs, whatever. And kind of like with uh, anything else, I started looking at YouTube videos, uh, starting with John Boy. And man, I went down like a three day rabbit hole of just all this stuff about the Astros and the Black Sox scandal and everything. And from from an unbiased fan, because I love Houston, I'm from here. But if I mean, honestly, they should get the book thrown at them if this is true. And it looks like it is true. Uh, the way that, you know, Jim Crane and AJ Hinch and the way that everyone's handling the situation, I'm, I'm very intrigued. I, you know, as a Houston fan, I hope that the players don't get punished because at the end of the day, you have to kind of do what your employer tells you to do. You're not going to be like, Oh, don't, I'm not going to do this. Although, you know, it's some way it is wrong that you shouldn't cheat that way. But, uh, AJ Hinch, a lot of those guys really need to get the book thrown at them. And right now we're. We're watching potentially the greatest ESPN 30 for 30 unfold in front of our eyes. Yeah, that's that's a good point because the investigation is still going on. And if you look at the ramifications in the league already, the ripple effect is is definitely happening. And it starts in Houston in the American League West, because once these allegations started coming out, what did you see? 
you started seeing people getting fired. You started seeing uh, players getting traded, notably someone like Jake Marisnik, who hit 160 on the road and 307 at home. Then yeah. you've got guys like Correa that are being shopped around right now. Tells me that he might not be one of those trusted good guys that you were talking about. Right. So, and you know, it, it also tells me that Correa might not be that great of a hitter. Yeah, and it's uh, it's all it's very subjective. It's very weird to see. I still, I, I still love the Astros. You know, I, I, unfortunately, all of this is kind of, it's, it's really, you know discolored the way that we look in 2017 with that world series championship but i wasn't a big baseball fan harvey just hit the work i mean houston was pretty much you know we were beat up from you know harvey but seeing them win the world series is unlike anything especially for a team that's never won it before uh it's you know it was great to see so it's very disappointing the way that the way that this has been unfolding um I mean, do they take the World Series, you know, pennant from them? No, because it's, I mean, you could, but we're always going to look at it as, well, they won it in 2017, whether they cheated or not. It's, it's, it is what it is now. You can't go back and change history. But, you know, whether it's, you know, trying to limit us on trades, free agents, big fines, I, I honestly think you can slap the book or throw the book at us ever which way. It's never going to change unless they get rid of someone like AJ Hinch and you just try to clean clean management and get rid of all that bad juju for something like this. It ha it has to go even further than Hinch. I know he's probably what third in command of the organization, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it needs to go even further up because if this was going along for that long of a period, the entire front office knew about this shit. But what's, what's great is everyone's realizing that shit's about to happen to Houston. They're not going to be the dominant team there in the American League West. And what are you seeing in free agency right now? You're seeing American League West teams signing up these big acquisitions. Anthony mm -hmm. Rendon just went to the Angels, who are, yeah. who are stocking up. They've got Rendon now. They've got Trout. They've got uh, Shohei Otani, who should be healthy this season. They're starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And then the Rangers, they made a huge splash by getting Corey Kluber. Uh, that is a, a franchise-changing acquisition because he is a true ace of a staff that can carry a team. They're moving to a brand-new stadium there in, uh, in, te in for the Texas Rangers. I think it's still yep. in Arlington. But, yes, it is, yeah. But uh, – They've got to bring in big name acquisitions to put asses in seats. No one's going to come watch a mediocre team and they've got to pay the bills. Yeah. I mean, and you know, I, I still hope we're good. I think we're still going to be a good team. It's just, you know, now we're under a microscope. It's, uh, I actually made the comment months ago or a month ago when this happened, you know, this must be what it feels like to be a Patriots fan. Uh, <laughs> and now we go full swing with Spygate 2.0, which, in my opinion, I think this new, not to change subjects real quick, but the whole Spygate thing, for example, and this is what I hope we can avoid as for the Astros. The Spygate 2.0, I don't think is nearly as big as what was going on before. Honestly, I think this might have been some stupid, you know, freelance guy they hired and he was being an idiot. Probably, you know, somebody else that wasn't Bill Belichick told him, hey, try and film this if you can. And this guy obviously got caught. I don't think that this was directly involved with football operations however because of the track record between goodell and the patriots everyone's automatically throwing them under the bus and i have a feeling that no matter what the astros try to do any little wrongdoing it's going to be the worst thing for them and we're going to automatically look like the ultimate villain which i i hope we can avoid but when this sort of thing happens it's very hard to you know keep your nose clean according to the way media puts it yeah, and you that's public enemy number one real quick as you as you continue on with your your career, if you will. If you're a member of that club or the team, you've got a, a, a red X on your name forever because, oh, you're you're part of that squad. Two things that will make people hate you get caught cheating, win championships. Yeah. Then yeah. it's even worse if you do both. <laughs> exactly. But to be honest, I, I'm not a Patriots fan. 
Uh, I get, I do. I am one of the people that is a little frequently, you know, tired of them winning all the time or being in the Super Bowl. But I do respect the franchise and I do respect the organization. I think they handled the Antonio Brown situation tremendously. I think that they are doing the right thing by keeping him off the roster. And they're doing whatever they can to keep their nose clean. And that's why, although this Bengals situation does look a little sketchy, I don't think that, you know, they're as guilty as what the media is trying to paint it to be. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think that you're you're spot on with that. And if you look, every team out there cheats at some point, pretty much every year. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a website called your team cheats or my team cheats or one of those look it up all the teams are listed all the times they've been caught cheating and then you can scroll through and just be like oh i didn't even know about this i didn't know that the the rams did this or i didn't know that the vikings did this look look it up check on your team see see the last time you had a big cheating scandal mm -hmm. and how out of proportion it was blown almost everybody has a spy gate yep so it's only a big deal when it's the Patriots. Um, but what I think this Spygate 2.0 has essentially done is lead to a, a deflate gate 2.0, if you will. And that deflate gate is Tom Brady's morale because he's already had a season where they've gotten rid of big name receivers from his squad. They, they just released Antonio Brown, which he was being an idiot. They released Josh Gordon for no reason, but apparently something else might have been in the works. Who knows? Um, well, now we do know. Well, we don't know if that was happening when he was in New England or if it was right. something that. But it does make the decision to release him a little suspicious. Mm -hmm. But Tom Brady's had to deal with all that. The offense that hasn't been clicking. And now you throw another scandal in the mix how can you get up next season and be like, all right, let's do this shit one more time. Fuck that. If I'm Tom Brady, I'm done. Yeah. I, I walk away. I or, but where do you go? Go home. <laughs> go fucking home. Go yeah. to Giselle. Put, put your six rings on and fucking watch TV for a while. Like, fuck, man. We see, but we think that way. But Tom Brady is, you know, his TB12, his... I, I, I think I think he's going to be in the league for at least two to three more years. I would be shocked if he retired within the next two years, unless he took some season ending injury. But I don't know, man. I, I mean, he I could see him going to a different team before he retires. No, I, I think absolute retire no. Patriot. Uh, he, he's got Har like a Harvey, one of our uh, listeners, commenters said that if you're going to cheat against anybody, why would you cheat against the Bengals who have only won That's, one game this season? Yeah, you, you know, Harvey, good point, but you stole it out of my mouth. I was going to say part of the reason I, I, I'm on the Patriots side with this is why the fuck would they need to cheat against the Bengals of all people? Mm -hmm. If you're going to cheat, why, why weren't they cheating against the Ravens or the Chiefs or the Texans, you know, the teams that actually beat them? Well, and you go back to Deflategate, uh, and it's funny that the Colts brought all that shit up. But I think in the game they were accused of cheating. I think four touchdowns were run by LeGarrette Blunt, something like that. The the football being thrown through the air wasn't even a big part of their success in that game. Yeah. So it's just kind of like, okay, well, sure, they were running the ball. It was deflated a little bit. No one was throwing it. Pigskin was staying on the ground. So I don't I don't see what your argument is. But Well, that and that interception that the Colts intercepted that led to the whole deflate gate was at the end of the first half. The Patriots came out and scored 27 points in the second half or something like that. They blew them out in the second half. Yep. So your, their point was irrelevant, but it, it was blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. um, we saw some great action in week 15 of the NFL, aside from uh, the Patriots and Bengals game, which was a blowout. <laughs> One of the biggest shockers of the entire week had to be when the Atlanta Falcons went to San Francisco and beat the 49ers. So weird. It's so weird. Yeah. And, you know, they say any given Sunday, something like this could happen or whatever. But what that does is it causes a, a clusterfuck in the NFC. 
because they went from being the number one seed to the number five seed. <laughs> and you know who's sitting pretty at number one right now? Adams Seattle Seahawks. Uh... But you still have another game with the 49ers. And we just lost Josh Gordon. Yeah, which let's talk about that. Josh Gordon being suspended for PEDs and violating the uh, substance of abuse policy of the NFL. Whew. Now, Adam, I think the last time that we had you on, we were talking a little bit about Josh Gordon, and you said, mind you, he was a, a member of the New England Patriots at the time, you said that you bet he wouldn't make it the entire season, and boy, were you right. <laughs> but you didn't know that it was going to bite you in the ass. Yeah. So that's kind of ironic and kind of funny, but it sucks that this happened to Josh Gordon, especially in light of Major League Baseball announcing, you can smoke weed now. Mm. No problem. Yeah. So why can the MLB do that, but the NFL can't? Do you think this was, I mean, can this be isolated to marijuana, though? Because they, they say PEDs are the drugs anti anti-drug policy so is it is that all, all blanketed in the same yeah. statement okay yeah, it's all just one huge blanket a drug pops on this test and it's just this huge blanket of whether it's a ped or a, a drug of abuse or whatever so well, you know what i mean as, as Stephen a would say stay off the weed uh they just need to kick josh gordon out of league completely ban him that dude should not put on another nfl uniform ever again if you've breaking something, broken the rules this many times, and it's the same offense, you 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 shouldn't have an opportunity to make this much money on Sundays. I'm sorry, but that's that's ridiculous. I just thought of something uh, a while back. I can't remember what was brought up, but Brandon and I were talking about some player. It might have been Pat McAfee or one of those dudes. He said that you only get tested for weed or you take a piss test once a year. If if Josh Gordon is popping for weed, is he on some sort of like he's in the the program? protocol. He's in the protocol. It's tested because everybody. Th see, that's the point that I was going to make to Adam uh was yes, even if this was a PED issue which is separate from from weed. Yeah. Um the reason that it's coming up is because he's in that drug test protocol where mm -hmm. he has to get randomly drug tested. So if he were, were not ever to be put in that because of his previous weed pops, then he would probably still be on the Seattle Seahawks roster. What that does for me though, is good things because I have DK Metcalf on my fantasy squad. And I hope that means he gets a few more targets. Well, and I mean, I, I can, I can spin this in a positive light. So we got to basically rent Josh Gordon for a little bit during the season, make some miraculous plays like in the last game. You know, he he made a hell of a catch uh, just this past Sunday. So hell of a catch, you know, and he did help out DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Jake Hollister, all these other guys catching, you know, catching passes from Russell Wilson by diverting, you know, some other defensive backs his way. Now we don't have that luxury, but you know, maybe he did get to kind of show DK Metcalf a couple of things and he gets to, you know, put some tricks in his bag. But I don't think this is going to make or break the Seattle Seahawks. No, I don't think so either. I don't think so either. You guys were doing fine before he got there. You'll do fine once he's gone. In fact, his arrival actually hurt DK Metcalf in fantasy because he was balling out before the arrival of Josh Gordon. And afterwards, he saw a downtick. So... We're in the playoffs now, so I hope that hope that we get some more DK Metcalf. Yeah, y'all, I was jinxing y'all's league or something, man. My team was loaded, and I couldn't get it together. <laughs> yeah, I it, hate that. I think it 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 is funny because you are I I want to say third overall in points, mm -hmm. but you lost in the wild card round of playoffs. Oh, not just that. I lost. I think I won three games. Three, I think three weeks I won, and the rest I lost. Wow. But for, for some reason, anytime I'd play anybody, they had their all-star week against me. It happens. And, yeah. you know, the, the one guy in the league that's been thumping everybody, he's due to have an off week, so. Yeah. <laughs> Any given Sunday, right? That's what yeah. they say. So, 
the good thing about fantasy is that you don't have to go outside and you can sit there and monitor it on your phone. The Kansas City Chiefs and the Denver Broncos played a game in which they were experiencing a blizzard. Did you guys catch any of that? No, yep. I did. I did a little bit. And Some Zach, I know you're there in Missouri, so you got to literally see the same kind of uh, conditions. Yeah. But, but um, that game was. Those games are always a blast to watch. Anytime that there's a shit ton of snow on the field, you never know what to expect. Zach made the early prediction here in Sportszilla that if you have Mahomes, don't start him because it's a snowy day and it's not going to be good. And then he came out and lit yep. it up. Yep. <laughs> in in classic Nest Podcast fashion, when you talk shit about a player, he immediately does amazing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Same's also true for Julio Jones, yeah. who uh, I saw that graphic that he had not scored a touchdown in nine games, and I immediately pulled out my phone and I text Justin, who's normally on with us, and I said, what's up with your boy, man? Zero touchdowns? And he's like, yeah, you stopped talking shit about him, and then what do you know? <laughs> a two-touchdown game. Yep. Yep. It's it's something, man. There There's something going on. People hear us get fired up and then turn it around. I guess, man, that uh, all these stars have to be listening to us. That's the only logical conclusion that we can draw from this. Man, I, re- I wish I could get a retweet every now and then. Right? Damn. <laughs> At least a like. Yep. <laughs> um, the Jags pulled off a dub this week. I know you didn't start Gardner Minshew, though I wish you would have. But they pulled off a dub. In an impressive fashion, they were down down 16 to three and then storm back and beat Oakland in Oakland in the final game ever played at the Oakland Coliseum. Yeah. Kind of a, kind of a sad day. Um, the Raiders were booed off their home field for the last time. They're of course going to, to Las Vegas next year. Raider nation fashion. Yeah. Typical Raider fans, you know, just boo the team, fuck them, which I mean, I it's, technically the town's fault because they wouldn't they wouldn't put up the money they didn't want to pay the money to build a new stadium so teams going somewhere with that will can't blame the team yep. yeah and i mean they've been playing in that field that they share with the giants for fucking ever so yeah, yeah i don't blame them i mean the a's the oakland a's oh yeah you're right yep um and I hope, honestly, that the A's move out of there soon because that place is a fucking dungeon. <laughs> it's a it's a terrible ballpark, and yeah. it's always empty. No one goes to their games. That's funny. It's sad. It's yeah. not funny. It's sad. But oh well. Something else that happened this weekend on Saturday that that we were all keeping up with UFC two forty five. I know a lot of our our Sportszilla fans are rabid when it comes to their MMA, and I saw posts flying in there all night long. One of the first ones that came out early on was when uh, Aldo seemingly got screwed out of a victory. 100%. How how did you see that fight going, Zach? I mean, I think we all kind of talked about it over text, how we... We're just completely shocked that Aldo went down to 135, uh, but he looked fine. I mean, honestly, he looked really, really good, all things considered. And he he was, in my book, winning most of the fight. Uh, it was a little back and forth for a couple of rounds, but if you would have asked me, I would have said Aldo gets a unanimous, and he didn't get it. I just, it was very shocking. Yeah, it was a, a split decision. Um, I I agree that I thought Aldo should have won. I, I agree with the split decision, but I thought Aldo won two out of three. I would take that, too. But going into it, I thought he was going to die. I did, too. I, I thought I thought, uh, I thought Marlon, what is it, Mor- Moraes? Moraes. 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 Mm-hmm. I thought for sure he was going to knock him out. And he, he was throwing some bombs earlier. They just weren't landing. To Aldo's credit, he was able to dodge and block and limit the amount of damage from those big shots that he was throwing. What'd you think, Adam? Uh, I mean, honestly, you know, that's why they always say don't 
don't let your fate go to the judges because you're going to get screwed. Uh, going back and looking at some highlights, though, uh, Marlon Marias actually tweeted saying, I went back and watched, I think it was the second round, I'm not sure, and where people are very subjective saying Aldo definitely won that round that he lost. Uh, and the way that Marias saw it, saw it, and I kind of see the same way, is that you know Aldo is pressing forward most of the fight, but not really throwing anything that's causing any sort of significant damage. Uh, for a good amount of the fight, yes, he was controlling a lot of it, but I mean, that's why it's a split decision. It really could have gone either way. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I could say he got robbed in a way, but compared to some of the other fights that night, uh, compared to Holloway, for example, Holloway got robbed compared to uh, compared to Aldo. But I don't know. It's I feel like there were so many other things in that fight card that overshadowed Aldo's you know, robbing, as we would say. Um, sure, I guess Aldo won that fight. I mean, but at the end of the day, neither of those guys is going to hold the belt. So I, for me, it is it is what it is. Yeah, it's kind of a wash. Yeah, you're right. Uh, let's, I mean, Aldo is a former champ. If he if he were to be able to string some wins together, I think Cejudo might be a a fun fight for Aldo. But yeah, um, I guess you you touched on one of the biggies already with Holloway and uh, uh, Vol- Volkanovsky. Volkanovsky, Alexander the Great. <laughs> yeah, um, which I predicted going into the fight that he would win. I I texted Wallow and I was like, I got him winning. He's like, dude, you're no. I, I knew he was a tough dude, and he was going to give Max a, mm-hmm. a good fight. Max is, I don't know, that fight was it, kind of a snooze fest, to be honest. Put me to sleep. No, it, was, it was a shitty fight. Uh, it, my, you know, my philosophy, the way I see it is, when it comes to these championship fights, if there is not a decisive winner in any way, which in my opinion, I don't think there was, I think you still give it to the champion. And that's where I, the way I saw it was there was not enough conclusive evidence to say that his belt should be taken from him. I will say, though, that I was I was taking Holloway just because, um, you know, I think Volkanovsky is a good fighter. I just thought that Holloway's, you know, height was going to be to his advantage, being able to sneak some certain shots and angles that Volkanovsky would not be able to defend. Um but when you look at Holloway overall, I mean, besides the last couple of, you know, Aldo fights, he has, I mean, he got beat by Poirier, exposed a little bit. And other than that, he's kind of, uh, he's very beatable. He's not, a lot of people want to say that, oh, if, if he were to fight Connor again, he would clean Connor's clock. No, I think that Connor would still have his way with Holloway if they did fight today. Uh, obviously not at 145. I don't think Connor could ever make that weight again. But I think that, you know, Holloway is good, but, you know, Aldo is on the older, you know, on the back end of his career. So it's a little bit on the easier side to beat Aldo. I don't think he would have had it easy as a time uh, if it was primetime Aldo. But, you know, maybe Volkanovsky is, you know, he might be the champ for a little bit. I, mean, I think I think uh, the, the featherweight division is a little up in the air, which is why uh, Holloway has been so successful. Once Connor moved on, that whole division was just you know, left to the, whatever the pieces of shit that, you know, there, are, there's a handful of yeah. good fighters. Uh, there's a few, but that, that division to me is just, there's not anyone formidable in it, to be honest. Uh, Holloway's great, I guess, but all the way, uh, I would say T city, Brian Ortega. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brian, Brian's great. And we know that he could take a punch from that fight he had with Holloway. Uh, but then you go back to that fight and we, you know, we're all saying, damn, how good is Max? But now you look at it and it's like, is Max that great or is Ortega just not that premier with his striking? And he couldn't really get Holloway to the ground. And he was taking more shots than giving him. Uh, and another fighter to watch out that I think it's a matter of time that their champion in 145 is Zabit. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Zabit Magomed Monster. Sharipov, or I think that's how you say his name. Something like that. Sounds good to me. Yeah. It's a, that's a long one. Mm hmm. But he's from that same part of the world that uh, Khabib is from, and they they are a whole different kind of human. Yep. Yeah, they breed monsters for sure. I mean, they mm-hmm. wrestle bears as children, so. <laughs> yeah, wild. Mm-hmm. What did you guys think about the Jermaine uh, and Amanda fight? I was completely shocked. I How had no so? 
they I, I didn't know that they had fought before. So um, I was going into it thinking, you know, there's a Muay Thai uh, female. She's a former champion in whatever Muay Thai division. Um, and obviously Amanda Nunes is a fucking goat. Mm-hmm. I've kind of figured, you know, Amanda would piece her up relatively well. Um, but Jermaine, I mean, she she stuck with it and she weathered the storm. And if she would have had a a basic understanding of grappling, I think she would have st- stood a chance because all Amanda started do- to do was just hold her down. And she, she couldn't, you know, get out of the, get out of, um, the mount and any, or anything like that. So she was just kind of screwed, but for, for, to her credit, she weathered the storm. That is Amanda Nunes, which is impressive. Well, I think uh, I gotta I gotta correct one thing that you said. You said that if she had a basic level of jujitsu, she does have a basic level of jujitsu. She's a blue belt. Oh, okay. That's that's pretty basic. Amanda's a highly skilled black belt in jujitsu. That's that's like, you know. Oh yeah, a, that's like me going up against my son. Yeah. Maybe she's a little better than him because he he just lets me do whatever. <laughs> But uh, anyway, that's besides the point that she does have some skill. That's why she almost caught that triangle arm bar. Mm-hmm. Um, she that was slick. Amanda almost got caught. But being the more experienced grappler, Amanda was able to weather that storm and then get on top. What uh, Jermaine was lacking was any kind of escapes or sweeps from the bottom. When uh, when Amanda would even get in her guard, sh- all she could do is lay there and try to hold Amanda back, wait for Amanda to back up, throw up kicks, try to just do whatever. But she she couldn't sweep her. She couldn't advance the position. She couldn't even get out. She couldn't scramble to get out. Amanda had her at her mercy on the ground. So to that point, I think Amanda fought a very smart fight. Not the most entertaining, but it was a very smart fight for her. Yeah, she knew she did what she needed to do to win, um, and that's honestly that's kind of why I thought Jermaine d- didn't have a whole lot of grappling background is because she never tried to escape. She never bridged. She never shrimped. She never did anything. She just kind of laid there, which I was like, I mean, if you have any kind of grappling background, you know, unless you're you know a, a beast at the rubber guard to get from out under the person that's on top of you. That's like your first goal. And she didn't, as far as I know, never really tried, but that could also be summed up to, she was exhausted at that point. She's exhausted. And she has an elite black level belt. black belt on top of her. I get it. Yeah. And I think, you, uh, so sorry, go ahead. Go, go ahead, man. I was gonna say, I think, uh, what we saw witness to her, what we, you know, saw was that Amanda is, in my opinion, is a uh, a victim to her own success. I think that she took drained ran- drained around to me a little a little too light. I think she should have starched her. I think that she, uh, you know, I think she could have finished her much earlier than how the fight ended up going. Uh, there were a lot of times that Jermaine kind of threw her in a little position from the top, and fortunately to Amanda, you know, being the black belt that she is. Fortunately, Jermaine didn't know how to go to work from the top. There were a couple of different positions that she got Amanda in, and she it was almost like, now what do I do with my hands? I don't know yeah. what to do from here. And so it was a matter of just sitting on top of her. And um, Amanda would immediately go for a sweep and get out of the position. And then she was back on the, on the yeah. offensive. I just think for the level of talent that Amanda is competed against, I think that Jermaine is not in that realm. I'm I'm also biased. I'm not a fan of Jermaine Dur- Jermaine Durand to me. Uh, back in the day when my girl Holly Holm defeated Ronda Rousey in one of the greatest knockouts in the history of MMA, uh, the very next fight, her first title offense is against Durand Durand to me. I can't say her name right now. Whatever, <laughs> fucking Jermaine from from the Netherlands. Uh, and it was she she lost the belt to her, and it, in my opinion, it was kind of a bullshit loss. It wasn't. It was. It was to the judges. So it's, in it, in its way, her own fault. But I'm. I'm just not a fan of Jermaine. And then the whole issue with her fighting cyborg, cyborg potentially, and she pretty much vacated her belt at that point, from how I can remember it. 
Yeah, I remember her essentially just walking away. Mm-hmm. Is this 135? Yes. Yeah. Phantom weight. I thought. I'm also, go ahead. I thought Holly lost it to Misha Tate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm. Th- I'm remembering it wrong. But anyway, it's been a couple of years. My bad. It has. <laughs> anyway, he still doesn't like her, probably because she's from the Netherlands. That's fair. That sounds. Yeah. That sounds like something a Texan would say. <laughs> I like the Dutch soccer team, man. I'm not a hater. <laughs> fair enough. But I'm also a Shevchenko fan, huge Valentina fan, and I think that the second of the second fight she had with Amanda, I think it was much closer than people give her credit for. I think that I think she potentially beat Amanda, but you know, what do I know? Yeah. I mean, at this point, Amanda's ran through two divisions and I mean, I, I, especially for the 145 division, there are only five women in that division and four of them. Well, I guess three of them. I don't know. So that that division is basically hers, and for thirty five, uh, she's beaten everybody. So yeah. uh, just gonna have to do you know the the second fights for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is it's unprecedented and it's impressive at the same time. I'm waiting for the next the next great female to come along that will that will be able to at least compete. Because, you know, you have that every now and then. You have those phenoms that come and hang out, and they ride the top for a long time. Anderson Silva did it. Uh, John Jones would have done it if he didn't have all of his breaks in in performance. Um, Matt Hughes before that. GSP had long runs. Hell, even BJ Penn had a, a pretty long run as a champ. But then somebody always comes along and and unseats them. Yep. Who's going to be that person to unseat Amanda in either division? Yep. It's pretty much up in the air at this point. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a toss up. It's, it's hard to say there, there may be some, you know, young person coming up that, that has talent that we don't know about yet. But as far as I know, at this point, she's got both divisions locked up. Right now, in their in their respective divisions, I think Nunez and Shevchenko are going to be reigning champs for a good bit. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, one of the commenters, Anthony Long, says, "If Gina Carano was only ten years younger, God, right? She she's too busy being a badass in the Mandalorian, <laughs> which is phenomenal too. But yeah, I love Gina Carano, but damn, she cannot act. <laughs> she, she's oh. not the best actor. Yeah, but she's very pretty to look at. <laughs> I liked her. I liked her as an American Gladiator. That was fun. Yeah. If you remember when she did that, that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but the main event of the evening was definitely worth the wait, and it came on at like what twelve thirty, Eastern time. I I know you guys are different time zones, but that's that's pretty late for us to start a fight. But this one was worth it because Usman and Covington. Left it all out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, was it the second, third round? It was the third round when Covington broke, got, had his jaw broken. Yep. And he still fought for another two rounds after that. Mm-hmm. That's so fucking insane. Wow. What a tough bastard. Jesus. Yeah, we, uh, we were witness to the, definitely the two best welterweights on the planet. In I'll- any, in any martial arts form or you know promotion where do you go from here obviously colby's going to be out for a significant amount of time rehabbing yeah. that that jaw mm-hmm. um Usman's going to have to defend his belt somewhere else along the way I, i'm not calling for an immediate run it back between these two but at some point belt or no belt i want to see this fight ran back yeah 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 i mean i guess from a popularity standpoint, I guess Masvidal's up next. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So I don't think his BMF title really won him any any points for the actual welterweight belt. But you know, whatever. I mean, people like him. It'll it'll sell tickets. Might as well see if he can land on uh, Usman's chin. I, I'm up for it. But other than that, I don't know. I mean, I think Woodley might get a second chance. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do with him. 
Uh, he's pretty fucking old now too, and he's he's got like some weird rap career going on. So I don't even know if he wants it. Uh, if not Masvidal, we're gonna be looking at Usman versus Leon Edwards. Hmm. He's yeah. in the top five. I think that's who we're gonna be seeing. Um, I think personally, this fight's not gonna happen for a while because we still have to see uh, McGregor and Cowboy in January. I think the winner of that fight is most likely going to... I think if Connor wins, I think they're going to set up Connor and Jorge Masvidal. I think right now that is the biggest priority for that division, for Dana White. That that fight next year alone is going to make the most money of any promotion between those two fighters because so of you, what they you don't, bring. You don't, you don't think it'll be if Connor beats Cerrone, he gets the champ? I don't think immediately. I think they're. I think he wants to fight Masvidal. I think that's that's the word. They've been having a lot of back and forth on social media, and I okay. think right now that makes the most sense. Uh, in a, I mean, not even in a fair world. In this world alone, Connor does not beat Usman. Connor does not beat Covington. Uh, I don't. I don't know if he beats Masvidal, but I do want to see that fight. Sign me up for any fight with Conor McGregor's name on it. I would. I would. I would take that too. I think that's a good setup as well because say Masvidal does win, then it's no question he should he should get the next title shot. And if Connor can beat two people that we all know and respect, then he's back in it, you know? So mm-hmm. throw him to the wolves, see what he can do if he wants to fight at 170. Well, but do I think we, he, do we ahead. think do we think that Connor beats Cerrone? That's the first step. Do we I think he gets by possible. Cerrone? It's definitely possible. This fight is so fucking hard to call. Um, I, I I talked about it before on last on I believe our last show. So I'll let uh, Adam take take the wheel. So it's like you said, it's very tough to call because we it, it really just depends what which notorious are we getting? Are we getting are we getting Mystic Mac of the great 2014 2015 era? Are we getting Conor McGregor that we see against Habib? Which I will remind everybody who thinks, oh, it's Habib is so much higher of a level than Connor. This was a Connor McGregor where his last professional bout was in a boxing match against Floyd Mayweather. Uh, wasn't the best showing, in my opinion, but the man had not been in an MMA bat, you know, fight since Eddie Alvarez. It had been so long. And for his first fight to go against Habib, who's hands down right now, probably the best martial artist on the planet. People may disagree with that, but the man's 27, 28 in a row, no losses. It's pretty remarkable to do, and especially in the lightweight division. Uh, to take that as your first fight and to, you know, because most people would be very skeptical about making their very first fight against the, the top man in the division. For him to take that, that takes balls. And, you know, it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of courage to do something like that. And yes, he did lose, but he went four rounds with the guy. And people want to make up all these excuses like and use, you know, freaking, you know, fight science or whatever, or, you know, MMA. martial arts, MMA math <laughs> uh, and say, oh, well, Habib could have finished him in the first round or blah, blah. But he didn't. I mean, he did take him in the dark water eventually, but there was a reason that Connor was still in that fight. And anyone that wants to say, oh, well, he was he was just messing around with Connor. No, you can use that excuse for for Floyd Mayweather. Because he definitely had the advantage in that fight. He's going to drag him to deep water. He's going to let him punch himself out, essentially. Then he's going to take him and TKO him in the seventh or eighth round. But in a mixed martial arts fight, I think Habib knew very well, at any given moment, if I get caught, I I could be going down. And I do not want to get hit by Connor. And so, you know, he eventually took him out in the fourth round. But I think that a lot of people remember it wrong. And they think that it was a complete domination the entire fight. But... There's a reason Connor went four rounds. So now he's fighting Cerrone on the back end of his career. He's older. And from what I remember against uh, Tony Ferguson, he did not look that great. He's a tough guy, but his reaction time was incredibly slow. Uh, and against a fighter like Connor of that caliber, that's that's going to put you on your butt at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I basically said Cerrone's only chance is to take him down. Uh and I think he's just going to stand there and trade punches with Connor because he knows how to fight for the fans. And that's what people want to see. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to end well for him. Um, I mean, anything is possible, obviously, but 
I, I got to almost count Cowboy out of this, which is a tough thing to say, but... Yeah, as a Cowboy fan, I mean, we all are. Yeah, he's had he's had tough losses. Um, uh, what's that young boy that tuned him up? That oh, fought- um, uh, what's his name? Of course, I can't think of it right now. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, the... the Justin Gaethje. Yes, I mean... No, that's not the dude I'm thinking of, but he did that as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, he at this point in his career, he just can't keep up with the younger guys. You know, it, it happens. The 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 old veterans, they have heart and they they're tough, but at a certain point, the younger guys just overcome their skill level and their talent and whatever else. Um, I don't know. I I, I see Connor winning one way or the other. I don't know whether it'll be a knockout or just a decision or TKO or who knows, but um, this is this is a perfect fight for Connor to come back to. And you you know what? I mean, his MMA or his uh, his BJJ it can't be shit. I mean, he's been training for years and years with Dylan Danis now, who's a world renowned Brazilian Jiu Jitsu you know fighter. So it's not like he's been sitting around only punching the bag and working on his kicks. He's been working on the ground. So I'd be interested to see him, you know, in a level match against somebody, maybe a little better, the same caliber as him, how he would do on the ground. But I mean, well, I mean, only time will tell. Yeah. Like you, Adam, I'm curious to see which Conor McGregor we will get. Will we get the uh, Mystic Mac from back in the day? Or are we going to get what I like to refer to as comfortable Conor? The Conor McGregor that has several million dollars and has zero cares in the world other than paying for his legal fees that he continuously makes for himself. Hey, what's up, Wallow? Um, so if we get the young, hungry, aggressive Connor who's coming in there with nothing to lose and wants to win fights, then I think he could probably make pretty quick work of Cerrone because like, uh, I think it was you, Adam, I think you said that they're just going to stand there and bang. And I think said that, but I I agree with that. that. It, if Connor is, is the one that's going to, to be standing there banging against them. I think Connor wins against Cerrone every time. Um, Wallow made a good point, which Cerrone is going to show up because he's got a history of if he's the nice guy before the fight, he ends up getting his ass whooped. And if he's kind of an asshole before the fight, he comes out ready to fight. Right. I don't think he's going to necessarily be friendly with Connor, but I don't think that's really going to matter because like I said, if they stand there and bang in the center of the octagon, I've got to say, Mac has more power. Yep. You know what, Brandon, like you say, which which Connor we're gonna get. Um I'm honestly in a way, like i I wanna think that we're gonna get the old Connor back because obviously he's he's been training tough and I think he's you know, he's embarrassed against the Habib fight that he had. I think he doesn't want that same that same result. But what is this Connor that we're seeing? I guess he got humbled by Habib, but he's it's it's not like he's insulting people anymore. It's a matter of him, like you know, offering compliments here and there on Twitter to everybody. You got him, you know, against or with Aldo saying like you know what a professional weight cut this, and it's like he's giving compliments left and right. And it's I don't I don't know. It's very strange to see from Conor McGregor. I mean, if you knock somebody out in 13 seconds and then they tuck tail and run to another division, wouldn't you say something nice about him? <laughs> Send them on their way happy. I wouldn't say he tucked tailed. I mean, he had been trying to get a rematch with Connor, but Connor had said, "Well, I, I would fight you again. I'm going to go and fight for 155. I'm going to go fight Mayweather." And by and the then, and then what happened next time Aldo did fight at 45? I mean, yeah, the rest he got of history. Beat. Yeah, yeah, he got beat, and then now he's at 135 because 145 ers are too big for him these days. Yeah, he's trying to have like a resurgence at late in his career or whatever. Doesn't really sound like it's going to happen um, if they're going to give them bullshit L's, but whatever. That's neither here nor there. Um, anything else you guys want to cover? I, we kind of glossed over the Usman Covington. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a hell of a fight. Um, eventually, I'm sure they will fight again, but to me, it was relatively definitive. I mean, I guess you can kind of give uh, Colby a bit of a 
a bit of leeway because he broke his jaw. Um, but I mean, when when Usman finally finished him, it was he finished him decisive. It, yeah, just, yeah, he it, he put an end to it. Um, I I don't know. It, that's the a big vision. The big thing for me coming out of this fight is I gained a lot more respect for for Covington as a fighter. Mm-hmm. Um, he's still, you know, he runs off his mouth, but that's that's his shtick, whatever. That's yep. what he does. But as a fighter, I, I respect him a whole lot more now. And uh, to circle back, Wallow mentioned a pretty good uh, comment that Connor doesn't have Kavanaugh anymore. He has a new coach. So that could change his game plan and change up his training camp, all the dynamics, you know. Well, but he still has Owen Roddy, and he still has uh, Dylan Danis. And, I mean, he is right. You know, your friend is right, though. I mean, without John Kavanaugh on his corner, that's going to be a little different. But, I mean, we'll see, man. I mean, I, I would like to sit here and act like, I, you know, I talk to Conor McGregor every other day. I don't know what's going on in his head. I don't know what's going on in his camp. But... I like to think of someone that caliber that he's making, you know, he's taking the right steps and the correct per- precautions he needs to do to take on a, a opponent like Cowboy. I think I think he feels his legacy slipping away. He he got two belts, never defended them, took a giant uh, boxing match with Floyd Mayweather, made a fuckload of money, lost like we all knew he would, and then got beat by the best grappler in the world. So, I mean, he he came on strong, made a hell of a, a show for everybody, and then just kind of disappeared. So, I think what he wants to do now is show people I'm I'm I actually am one of the best fighters in the UFC's history or whatever. Um, so I don't know. It all depends. Like you said, is he is he comfortable, Connor, or or does he is he hungry again? Yeah. So I guess we'll find out in February. And then, you know, in all that whole ramble that we just had about the uh, the division itself, we forgot Justin Gaethje in the fights altogether. We can't Mm -hmm. skip him because he should be theoretically next in line. Well, that's 155. Um, So, yeah, he'll he'll be fighting whoever the champ is there. I I honestly don't even know who the fucking. I honestly hate how much these guys are moving around weight classes <laughs> well, because Connor holds all the cards now that he's a fucking kajillionaire and he doesn't want to cut weight. Well, I think Connor's doing the smart thing, uh, not cutting too much weight, taking a fight like Cowboy against the big name guy, not a young and uncu- upcoming hotshot like Justin Gaethje. Mm-hmm. Um, and why not fight in 170? He fought against Nate at 170. Um it's not a giant weight cut. He probably walks around a little more comfortable at 170. I mean, you know, take a fight or two there. I think, circling back to it, I think the main reason he's at 170 is not because of what I just said, but because I think he really wants to fight Masvidal. That right now is his big ticket. Because no one no one wants, right now wants to see him fight Habib again. Uh, no one wants to see him fight Max because it's he's not going back down to 145. There's not really a potential rematch. Nate isn't really there anymore. I mean, I don't really care to see that third fight. I yep. mean, honestly. Uh, but fight Masvidal. Why not? Masvidal has caught fire uh, yeah. since his knockout of Till. I mean, Masvidal's the, almost the new Nate because he's like the thug, bad boy, street fighter type guy now that Nate mm-hmm. was back a few years ago. That everybody yeah. loves. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Everyone's favorite gangster. Yep. And he proved that the East Coast is more gangster than the West Coast. What's up, <laughs> Florida? Now, Zach, we kicked off the episode and we kind of talked a little bit about baseball, but there's more to baseball than what we talked about earlier. Uh, free agency this past week has been insane. We've seen multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts thrown around like it's nothing. Um, you know, we mentioned... Anthony Rendon going to the Angels and Kluber getting traded to the Indians. But on top of that, Strasburg decided to stay with the Nats. Uh, Seven years, $245 million to stay in Washington. That's kind of shocking. And then Rendon leaving, that's a big gap that they have to fill immediately. 
So good luck on your next seven years in Washington there, uh, Steven Strasberg. Garrett Cole signed with the Evil Empire for nine years, $324 million. Between Garrett Cole and Giancarlo Stanton throughout, like I think, 2029, they've got about $674 million on the books for those two guys. God. Jesus. You know, you know why but, that happened? What, why is that? The Yankees couldn't stomach the fact that they didn't win a World Series this past decade. So they they just fucking backed the truck up and paid everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty true. And I saw a rumor floating around that the Yankees were shopping uh, Stanton and uh, what would be a huge trade with Colorado to bring Arenado to New York. Good God. Yeah, that which I mean, you're replacing one huge contract with another, so it's whatever. But that I think Arenado is a much better player. Hundred percent, yeah. Um, did it, did it, did it. Gregorius isn't going to be on the Yankees next year though because he signed in Philly. So yeah. I don't know. They've had the Yankees have had some good talent coming up from their farm with uh, Urshula and and Torres and all those young infielders that can't kind of came up and and performed better than they they were expected to. I guess, which sure. I mean. My son could probably hit a home run at Yankee Stadium, so it's not saying much. But, yeah. man, have you ever taken a look at that, Adam? I know you don't follow baseball much, but the short porch at Yankee Stadium is only like 230 feet. Like That's that's closer than most high school baseball fields. It's I will say one, one thing I don't, you know, or one question I ask myself watching this postseason – I'm very – is there any certain kind of regulation that these teams need to follow when they, you know, design the size of their of their field? I mean, is there – you can – I mean, you have, like, the Green Monster, and then you have uh, the Crawford Boxes in Houston. You have all these different stadiums and different designs, and I'm, it's very weird how there's not a single standard regulation as to what distance your, you know, your your fence needs to be at. I believe the only regulations are a part, you know, of course the infield stuff is all regulated, but as far as the, the size of the outfield, if you will, is the, the foul poles have to be a certain length. And then okay. after that, it's just go for it. Yep. Whatever you that's, want. Okay. That's pretty much it. And yep. that's one of the things that makes baseball so much cooler than any other sport is because every stadium is unique in basketball, football, you know, soccer, anything like that. It's all marked out to be exactly the same in every other sport. Yep, and baseball is much cooler in that regard. For uh, for like a pitcher standpoint, like Garrett Cole specifically, his world is about to change drastically. Oh, he's going to get fucking rocked. Yeah, Brandon mentioned it on Sportzilla. His his flyouts are now going to be home runs, and it's going to be a totally different ball game for him. He's he's going to have a higher ERA, a higher home run count. And pitch less innings than he did when he was in Houston. Uh, Anthony asked what the uh, price was that Philly paid for Didi Gregorius. It's one year, seventeen million dollars. So, and I for Didi, I predict predict a much less offensive product production out of him because he doesn't have that short porch. A lot of his home runs were to that right field area because he's a left-handed pull hitter. That's where he hits them. I in mean, if Philly, you're a, in Philly, those are going to be out. Yeah. If you're a Yankee and you're a right-handed batter, just fucking pull all day and you will hit homers. Left-handed. You have to be a left-handed batter to pull there. Oh, it's on the yeah, other. Yeah, it's okay. right field. If you're, if you're right-handed, you love it too because you stay with a pitch and you go oppo and you don't have to have much power to go yard. That's how Stanton hits so many homers in New York. He just sure. and judge judge just hits it well enough to get it up in the air and it travels through like 250 feet and it's 17 rows deep. <laughs> it's insane. Um, another guy, uh, Madison Bumgarner signed a five year deal with uh, the Diamondbacks, which is great news for me because uh, the rumor was that the Cardinals were kind of shopping him and. I just I was so afraid of them signing some ridiculous contract to this old fart. Do you know what he signed for? Uh, it was in the hundred million range, I believe. 
Um, I can look it up real quick. Okay. Yeah, no no problem. But I know you did say for days on end going into uh, what Bumgarner finally was announced that you hoped oh, that no. he would not end up in the Cardinals. $85 million for five years. That's, that's, still, that's, that's still significant, though. I mean, for a, for a veteran pitcher, that's a lot. But, I mean, the Diamondbacks don't have a whole lot going on other than uh, their second baseman could tell Marte, so... Yeah, but they've they've tried this before in Arizona with great success. They had a a nice young core of players, and then they brought in a couple of aging pitchers, a couple of veteran pitchers. Back then, it was Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson. So now they're bringing in Mad Bum. Look for them potentially to make another splash on one of these pitchers. Sure, yeah. You know, they missed out on uh, Rick Purcello. He signed with the Mets, so he's not going to be in Boston. But Boston trade rumors have uh, David Price on the trade block, Nathan Eovaldi on the trade block. So maybe if Price makes his way over to the Diamondbacks, they've got their two-headed pitching monster, and then they they let that young core go to work. Yeah, for sure. And I I believe uh, from the Dodgers, uh, Ryu is, is up for some sort of contract as well. Ryu is being shopped right now, I think, and or or is he a free agent? I'm not sure. Either way, God, that kid is nasty. Mm-hmm. And if if he's able to move to one of these other teams, like I fully expect the Texas Rangers to make a couple more splashes. They're going to try to keep up with the Angels in the West for making the biggest moves because, yeah. like we said earlier, the the Astros are vulnerable. Right. Yeah. And I. I'm not sure if he's being shopped actively or if he's a free agent or whatever, but I, I would assume Francisco Lindor is going to be on the move as well at some point. You know, I saw the rumors the other day that he was uh, being talked about or being linked to the San Diego Padres, and that would be a hell of an infield with Manny Machado, Francisco Lindor, and Tatis Jr. Jeez. Holy shit, what an infield. Yeah. And then you got Hosmer at first. That's yeah. an all-star infield. They just they they just have shit pitching right now, and that's going to be the downfall. Is you don't want to spend all those millions of dollars and have shit pitching, right? Because you're you're not going to be able to score 17 runs a game. Yep, I agree. So, do you guys think this is a uh, this is it for the Astros? Do you think this yeah, is really right. gonna? I think they're going to have a changing of the guard when it comes to the front office. I I fully expect uh, their general manager to get some sort of indefinite suspension, AJ Hinch to get some sort of indefinite suspension. But I think from the from the player standpoint, like you said, I think they they were just kind of going along with the club's, you know, whatever their plan was. Um, I don't know what they're going to do with the players, but. They have they have a good staff still. I mean, there are those players that, you know, like Brandon said, were trash on the road and then were great at home. Um, and those guys will be found out after after all this comes out. Um, but they still have a great pitching staff, even uh, even without Garrett Cole. Verlander is a fucking beast. He's getting older, but he's still great. Zach Granke is very good. Um, so, I mean, they're still in it for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, this, whatever happens with this, uh, investigation is, is going to be pretty intense. I think there's going to be some big, big, uh, stuff coming from it. I wouldn't be surprised if the Astros still have a competitive team for the next two or three seasons, but after the ramifications of losing draft picks and losing talent and, you know, you have to to bring in a new coaching staff, a new management, and all that stuff. It's going to make them fall off the radar, and I yeah. think that's why it's smart that all these American League team West or American League West teams are stocking up now because they know for the next few years they're going to be more competitive, and the Astros are going to be going downhill. Right? They fucked themselves. Yep. Shit yeah, happens. It sucks, but. Man, I miss baseball. <laughs> I'm so ready for baseball season to start back. Yep. 
I uh, thoroughly enjoyed watching the postseason. I had a lot of fun. My yeah, wife it's great. and I had a great time watching the Astros. Yeah, it, was, it was a blast. It, it's so much fun. Um, and it's even more rewarding when you can watch it from spring till fall. Because it's it's like you see the guys grow throughout the season. You yep. You see where they struggle and where they adjust and how they get better. And then how they piece it all together at the end. And yep. that's that's the final product is what you see in the playoffs. And yep. it's it's fantastic to see it all come together. You see the guys come up from the minor leagues and you're like, oh, dude, this guy's going to be the shit. I, like me last season with Michael Chavis. I was over the moon with that kid. Mm-hmm. And he's still going to be good. He's going to be fantastic for our franchise going forward. So yep. I'm excited to watch more of him play this year. Yeah, I wish is go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was going to change the topic. Oh, uh, I was just going to say the the baseball season is so long that you can see a real change throughout the year. Like the the team will be on a skid and then they'll pick it back up and you'll see a player get sent down to the minors and come back and be on fire. And like Brandon said, it's just it's so awesome to see throughout the whole season, the, the, the evolution of the team. Um, and I, I get, it's not the most exciting sport in the world, but I don't know. There's something about it. It's just, it's awesome. I love that. It's on every fucking night throughout the summer. You know how after the NFL season, we're going to get the XFL season immediately after I wish baseball had the same thing to where they had like a winter league where all the teams played in domes or whatever. Yeah. And you just got winter baseball. They could have some funky rules or whatever to to differentiate it, I guess, if you wanted to. But that's what I want. I want a winter baseball league. XLB. That's what we need. <laughs> the, the <laughs> XBL. It would be the XBL. <laughs> yeah, that that would be awesome. I would come up with some cool rules, change it up a little bit. Right. I'm looking forward to the XFL. We have a team, so I, you know, I'll be checking that out. Yeah. Yeah, same here. I think it'll be hopefully entertaining. Yeah. I mean, there's some good talent. There's yeah. some good talent at quarterback especially. Yeah, Cardell Jones, Aaron Murray. I mean, there's there's some good talent playing quarterback. But right. we'll see. Sammy Coates is actually playing, I think for the for the Houston Roughnecks. I know one of the uh, the XFL quarterbacks got got recruited or whatever by the I want to say the Lions, and the XFL stepped in and was like, "Nope, he's our guy. Back off." Yeah. <laughs> That's fine because he's already been assigned a team and is already on their payroll and stuff. So mm-hmm. that's their dude. Yep. Yep. So and I think the XFL has uh, has some good things going for it. Because their games are going to be viewable. They're going to be on, I believe, ESPN and whatever other networks. So, and that's what I said about the AAF. If you can watch the games, people will watch them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it's when you go obscure and you go on some channel no one has, or you go subscription service or, you know, whatever it might be, people just tune out. But if they can make the games entertaining and if you can watch them easily, they, they have a real shot. I agree. I'm yep. excited for the XFL. I'm excited to to see what it's all about this year. And maybe one day they'll bring the XBL and come and ask us for for our ideas and our thoughts. <laughs> Would we have a robot ump? What do you think? I I don't know. It's worth a shot. I think I think what we do is we set up like a like a ump figure behind the plate that has like a box in its chest. And if the ball goes in the box, it's a strike. If it misses, it's a ball. Fuck off. That's a good idea. <laughs> no, it's not because the ball <laughs> breaks at the plate, and we want to measure it at the plate and not behind the plate. It's right. a terrible idea. Why'd well, you let me suggest that, Zach? <laughs> put a, like, hyperimpose some sort of laser box or something in the air. And if it goes through that box, then, then it's a strike. So you're telling me we get freaking laser beams? I'm into it. Sold. <laughs> it's the XBL. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> we can do whatever we want. Okay. Uh, you guys good to go? We've been on for an hour 10. So cool. I'm good. Yeah. All right. 
guys, thank you so much for being here. Adam, thanks for joining us. Welcome back to the world of podcasting. Hopefully we'll reignite that flame for you. Absolutely. It's good thank to be you. back. Thank you to everybody that's been uh, listening and commenting and following along on Sportzilla. You guys are awesome. We appreciate the feedback and hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, please go check out the Nest podcast on everywhere podcasts are available. Like, download, subscribe, whatever. Go listen to the Bearded Biesta podcast. I guess he's below me. Go listen to the Bearded Biesta podcast. Um, it's iTunes, Podbean, all of those as well. Um, hopefully he'll be pumping out some new stuff soon, but some of That's his old plan. stuff still worth a good listen because he deep dives into some of these Marvel conspiracies and shit like that. Uh, Zach, you shouldn't wear yellow according to Anthony long. Okay. That's fair. I don't know. Not sure what that means, but there you go. Uh, anyway, Zach and I will be guest hosts on locker room talk this week, Friday, and it'll be right here on Sportszilla TV. So hopefully you guys will come and check us out. I'm sure we'll have more in-depth conversation about MMA and other fight sports and probably just whatever the hell we want to talk about that night. So check that out, and we'll see you then. Peace. Stay connected with Brandon and Zach on Facebook and Instagram at The Nest Podcast. And tune in next week for a brand new episode. Thanks for listening.